Welcome to this first um, seminar put on by the uh, SEC Children's Ministries on Loving Discipline. I'll say a little bit more about the rationale for putting on this seminar in a while, but um, shall we bow our heads for prayer first? Our kind and loving Father, we just want to thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day, and we thank you that despite of all the challenges we've had with illness and COVID, that we have the grace of technology to be able to come together and continue your work and to learn more about how to treat our children, how to grow them up in a loving way, and at the same time teaching them. We thank you for our guest speaker, Karen Holford, and her that it was a seminar uh, of this nature is because, as you know, we deliver the Keeping the Church Family Safe, all about safeguarding, and that's a half-day training. And one of the things that always comes up, and we never have enough time to discuss, uh, it's when we get to the issue of disciplining, disciplining children. And you all know the well-known proverb 1324 about what happened, you know, spare the rod and spoil the child. And I think that is perhaps one of the most uh, widely misunderstood and misused phrases. And I'm not going to say any more about that because that's Karen is going to uh, explain why that is. And uh, I think that will be uh, a new learning of the real meaning uh, of, of, of that uh, text. So um, lots of issues comes up. Different cultures have different approaches to discipline. Um, and I felt, along with uh, the trainers, I don't know if Liz Ford, our lead trainer in KCFS, is on, um, but we felt that we ought to have a dedicated um, session that looks at this. So we're not here for four and a half hours. It's a 90-minute uh, seminar. And I would ask, by way of housekeeping, if you can put your questions in the chat. Karen is going to speak to us for about 50, 60 minutes, because there's quite a lot uh, to share. And and then we'll have the rest of the time, um, half an hour for questions. If there are any burning issues or sensitive matters that need to be taken offline, uh, then please email me and I'll make the appropriate arrangements. So, for example, if there are family challenges. So we're very privileged and honoured to have Karen Holford, who I hope is no stranger to us in children's ministries. Karen is a former uh, children's ministries director for the um, South England Conference, the role that I uh, currently uh, occupy. And I've um, been a lifelong fan because I remember taking my daughter, who's now in her early 20s, to lots of um, adventure camperies, etc., where... Um, Karen, and I'm sure you know her husband, um, she's married to Pastor Bernie Holford. Uh, both are very passionate about family and children's ministries. And by way of credentials, um, uh, Karen uh, is... Um, uh, an occupational therapist, amongst many things. She's also a graduate, like Pastor Bernie, from Andrews University, uh, where she obtained her master's in educational development uh, psychology, education and developmental psychology, sorry. Um, and she also has a master's in systemic psychotherapy. And to, to you and I, lay people, that's family therapy. And Karen had worked um, for a number of charities when they were um, posted in, in Scotland uh, as a family therapist. So uh, we're very honoured and very privileged. And I know you've got a lot to share with us, Karen. Thank you for um, coming and agreeing to do this. And we look forward to what you have to say. So I'm handing over straight to you. Well, thank you very much. It's really lovely to be with you all here and uh, to have this afternoon with you. And this is something that I'm actually quite passionate about. And I 
remember learning so much about God's love for me when I was a parent struggling with my own children. I think I think I learned more about God and his loving patience with me than my children learned about God from me, actually. And my daughter, who's now growing up and has her own children, is telling me how, how much she's learning about God through her own parenting experiences. So I think it's something God uses to grow us and to keep us humble and to teach us more about his patience. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about loving limits. And I like this picture I've chosen for the front. I found it and I thought, that's exactly what we need to do as parents, put a frame around God's love in the way that we relate to our children so they can see more clearly how God loves them and fall in love with him for eternity. So that's why they need these loving limits. So it's love and it's also a boundary to help them really stay on the safe side of their behavior. <clears throat> so it's interesting to think of the goals of Christian parenting because I have an idea that when uh, sometime in my life before I had children that you know good parents are those who can make their children obey instantly and uh, I think I've, I've really changed that over the years because that's not the goal of Christian parenting and I know sometimes as parents we want our children to obey instantly of course that's really nice but we don't want to create robots and also sometimes I think we want children to behave perfectly because it makes us look good and we need to really think about what's going on in our mind when we're relating to our children's behavior what's the most important thing for them and their relationship with God and to focus on their needs and to be aware of what ours are and also what we might have learned from our way that we were parenting and from our culture because we often have to move that aside and say God show us your culture God show us your way because we've all been broken uh, brought up in cultures and families yeah, that have had know. some brokenness none of us are perfect and uh, and so we need to look to God to teach us about parenting and, and as I was thinking about it I thought the goals of Christian parenting for me are to raise children who have an active experience of God's love and forgiveness and children who are have good characters who are happy kind loving cooperative successful in a, in a spiritual sense and there's many more I'm sure but that needs to be our focus children who understand God's love for them and want his character to be in their lives it's hard to be good and I'm just going to show you a video now of just how hard it can be to be good and we need to remember how challenging it is to follow the rules at times I think this works <laughs> Sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. Go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Oh, it smells really It's up to you. You can have it now or you can wait. Okay? I'll be back. Stay in the chair. Okay? Okay.
right, so I'm going to leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. Yeah, so we can see it's not always easy to uh, to obey, to do the right thing, to wait. And that was um, called the marshmallow test. And it was part of some research that was done. And this was just a kind of a, a replay of that done with some children today. But it was, um, it was done quite a few years ago. And they found that the children who could wait for the second marshmallow often did better in life because they could delay gratification. But another research doing the same kind of experiment with the marshmallows discovered that it depended whether the child could trust the person who gave them the marshmallow and promised to give them the second one if they were able to wait. And that tells us it's the relationship the child has with the parent that is really important or the adult in their life. Do they trust what you say? Are you trustworthy? And that is an important part of the relationship in which um, their obedience and their love can grow. You know, before we really start to think about um, parenting our children, we need to think about God's love for us and how he has patiently disciplined us in our lives. How has he parented you? What have you learned from the gentle, accepting and kind way in which Jesus related to people who were struggling to do the right thing, adults in his time? And how can Jesus be a model of a model parent rather than the imperfect way in which we have often been parented? I think we need to spend spiritual time thinking about these things to inspire us as parents. How has God parented us? I was reading in Ellen White in Child Guidance and she said, you know, sometimes as parents we get really frustrated when our children don't obey us. And she said, just remember, just keep in mind how you treat God sometimes when he asks you to do something. Do you always do what he says? Remember that and be considerate to your children. I love going to Psalm 103, and it tells us the Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He doesn't deal with us according to our sins or punish us according to our iniquities. Because as high as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy to those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, the Lord pities or has compassion on those who fear him. And I love this bit. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust and he made us out of the dust of the earth. He knows we're fragile. He understands. He cares. And he knows that it, we're fragile as parents too. How else does God parent us? He is patient. And I used to wonder about that. I would not put love is patient first. I would have put love is kind first. But Paul is wise. And I thought why patience is first. Because before we can be kind, we have to slow down to the speed of our children, the pace of those around us. When we slow down to their pace, live life at their level, understand them, it is much easier for us to parent them kindly. And um, because too often we're rushing around in our own world, dragging the children along behind us. And love is first of all patient. When it is patient and calm and listens and assesses the situation and sees the needs, then it can be more loving and kind. It doesn't dishonor others. It is not self-seeking all about what I want. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth, protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres, and love never fails. And that is how God parents us. And he calls us to learn from him as we parent our children. 
I love this thought that we are co-parenting God's child with him. He has entrusted one of his children, or more, more than one, but every child is one of his children that he's placed in our care for us to co-parent with him. How does that change how you see your role as a parent, how you see your child, how you see God, how you see this whole relationship? Here are some parenting styles. Um, so there are structured parents, they have you know, rules and boundaries and unstructured that are kind of more chaotic and, and loose. And then there are distant parents who are more aloof and cool and warm and close parents who are very caring and loving. And it's interesting to see the kind of children, the kind of um, emotions and experiences the children have in those different families. So that's what's in red. So if you live with very structured, very rule-bound parents that are also very distant from you, you can end up very angry and lonely, resentful of the way you've been parented. And maybe you live in a chaotic home with neglectful parents. Um, you never know when your next meal is going to happen and you don't feel cared for and loved. Then you'll feel very sad and lonely. Maybe you have permissive parents who let you do pretty much what you want, but you know they love they love you. That will leave you feeling loved, but a bit confused. You're not sure what your boundaries are, and that is quite confusing. Or you might feel that you are more in control than they are because they will say, what shall we eat for dinner today? What, where shall we go today? And they ask the children for what they want, and uh, that can be sometimes confusing for the children. Children need love, but also clear boundaries. So when they have a structured environment with clear rules and warm and close relationship, then they feel safe, loved, and happiest. That's the best kind of environment for them. That's the kind of environment God created in the Garden of Eden. There was some simple structure, simple rules. He didn't give them many except don't eat the fruit from this tree. He was warm and close. He was with them all the time. He gave them this special safe place, the best place where they could feel safe, loved and happiest but still they disobeyed because as we learned from the marshmallow test even when there's one rule it can be hard to keep it so this is what Ellen White says about how to um, parent our children how to win love and confidence and she says to the parents if they would gather the children close to them and show that they love them and would manifest an interest in all their efforts and even in their sports, sometimes even being a child among them, they would make the children very happy and would gain their love and win their confidence and the children would more quickly learn to respect and love the authority of their parents and teachers. She's saying the relationship is important. They feel loved. They feel the parent is interested in The parent can play with them and enjoy life with them. And that builds their confidence and connection and love. Another principle of parenting is the oxygen mask principle. You know, as parents, we need to take care of ourselves first. Because if we haven't got our oxygen mask on, supplying what we need to live healthy lives, it's very hard to take care of our children well. So we need to make sure that we are well taken care of. And we might need to readjust our lives so that we have the space, the energy, the ability, the, the emotional stability, whatever it takes to parent our children well. I believe that parenting children is the most important job in the world. Um, and that we need to really value parents and mothers and whoever is taking care of the next generation because that is the most important thing we can do in this world is to create a generation of children with loving characters and happy personalities who are willing to love God and love others and, and live uh, flourishing lives. So we need to make sure that we are in the best place possible to help our children. Um, this used to really encourage me as a parent. I had three small children. I had I have three adult children now and three small grandchildren. And when my children were small, I found this first. And I can't tell you how many times I read it or meditated on it. God gently leads parents. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. 
and gently lead those who are with young. So God doesn't expect parents to rush around doing amazing almighty things. He knows that when you're a parent, the most important thing you can do is to take care of the lambs. And he wants to take care of you so you can, can take care of them. He gently leads you so that you have the energy for the, to care for the lambs as you need to. Another good principle of parenting is the love cup. We need to help children behave better by making sure their love cups are filled with affection, kind words, encouragement, positive attention, support, and fun. That's what Mrs. White was said. Have this wonderful, loving, fun relationship with your children because the happier they are in that space, the better they will behave. She says, kindness is key. Let them be sparing of censure, that's parents. Let kindness be the law of the home and school. Let ch children be taught to keep the law of the Lord. And let a firm, loving influence restrain them from evil. Fathers and mothers, in the home you are to represent God's disposition. You are to require obedience, not with a storm of words, but in a kind and loving manner, to be so full of compassion that your children will be drawn to you. The law of God in the home life and in the government of nations flows from a heart of infinite love. That is so powerful and so beautiful. Then there's a string principle. If you have a piece of string and you try to push it, it will go all over the place. It will wiggle this way and that. And it's very hard to make it go where you want it to go. But if you take it by the front end of the string and pull it gently, lead it in the right direction, it will follow on behind much better. So we need to lead children by showing them a good example of living patience, positive Christian life, meaningful apologies, quick forgiveness. When we treat them uh, the way we want them to treat others, when we show them by good example what, how to live, then we lead them in the right direction. If we push them, they can easily rebel. Also, there's lots going on beneath the surface of children's behavior. It's fueled by their emotions. Well-behaved children are generally supported by positive emotions. And children who are struggling to behave well are often overwhelmed by their difficult emotions and things inside them that they can't express. And they feel so confused and out of sorts that they cannot think clearly and control what they're doing very well. We need to help them manage their negative emotions and nurture their positive emotions. And I will be speaking about that in the seminar next Sabbath to help you understand more about that. But whenever I am brought a child who is struggling with their behavior, I know this is a child who's got lots of feelings going on inside and it's more than they can handle. So the happy principle is we don't help children to behave better by making them feel worse. So remember that. When you discipline your children, if you make them feel worse, then they will behave worse. If you make them feel better, if you give them confidence, they can do better next time. If you love them and forgive them and repair the relationship quickly so they never have to feel that you or God don't love them, then they can bounce back quicker and feel happier and more loved. And the happier and more loved they feel, the happier and more loving they will behave. And this is so important for us to remember. We don't help children behave better by making them feel worse. So we need to think as parents, I realized quite early on when I was a parent that I had a big responsibility about their behavior because if I let them go too long without food, if I didn't give them a drink when they were thirsty, if we took them out for too long, maybe even at church with church things, and they got tired, it was much harder for them to manage their behavior. Those are things that I need to take care of as a parent. I need to make sure that they're not hungry, thirsty, tired, or unwell. And if they are, I need to know that their behavior will be, they find it difficult to manage their behavior if their physical needs are not met. We also need to make sure their senses are not overloaded. Many children today are what we call high sensitivity. And I don't really like that term because sensitivity, oh, you're too sensitive. It has kind of a connotation of kind of a fragile being. But actually, these children and adults as well, and I, um, I know adults who, are, who have this issue, they are, I call them super aware. So basically, it means that they are very aware of all the sensory information coming into their body. And when they are children, they cannot filter it as 
people who are super aware when they're adults can filter kind of what they're listening to. They can move themselves away from a situation where their senses are overloaded. They can recognize what's happening in their body, but children can't. And a psychologist told me this is increasingly common in children. They are so overloaded that they just kind of manage their body, their, their expression, they just kind of lose control. And then they get told off by their parent, which adds to their sensory overload. They feel even more distressed. They're not being naughty. They're just so flooded with information, they cannot make sense of it anymore. And they need a quiet place to calm down with you. Just be wrapped in a blanket, held calmly in a quiet place, feeling your love to help them calm down. And I, I know this because... I realized when I worked with high sensitivity children that I have this same issue. That I am, I have super awareness and that I can get um, quite flooded by information and I've had to learn how to filter my own senses so that I can manage better. And also I had children and grandchildren who also have this. So I can see how it works. And they are, they're, they are just super aware of all their senses. And it's not that there's anything wrong with them or they're too fragile. They're just highly wired to be aware. And, and that's a good thing, but it's not so easy to manage if you're getting too much information that you can't manage. It's important to understand tantrums because quite often people see children having what they think is a tantrum and they think this is a naughty child and, and they should be treated in a certain way. But we need to understand that there are different kinds of times when children just lose control of their behavior. As I just mentioned, one is sensory overload. There's just too much going on for them to kind of make sense of. And after a while, they are so overwhelmed, they just kind of disintegrate and they cannot manage their responses anymore. Sometimes they're desperate from attention from parent or adult. They've been away from you all day, you've come in from work or you've been on your you've been working in the home all day on your on your computers and they're just really hungry for attention with you and when it all gets too much, they just kind of lose it. Um, and then they get kind of the wrong kind of attention because they've misbehaved or they're having a tantrum. Sometimes they have tantrums because they cannot make themselves understood and express their needs. And that's why next time session is helpful because we need to help children identify and name their emotions so they can talk about what they're feeling with us and we can help them with that. So sometimes they have, they have a tantrum because they're frustrated. There is something they're trying to do and developmentally they're not able to do it. Maybe there is something that is frightening them. Maybe they're just completely tired or have other powerful feelings and they just can't take it any longer. They just kind of, again, just disintegrate. Their behavior just gets out of control because they have been trying to hold everything together for so long and they've run out of the energy. So all of those need comfort. We need to understand what the child needs, help them to calm, help them with their struggle, help them to talk about what they want. The tantrum that is the one you need to manage best is the, the one where they are trying to control you and get what they want. That's the one that you don't give in to. So my daughter has a good way of managing this with her children. If one of them is having a tantrum, she will say to them, do you know what? I can't understand what you're saying when you talk to me in that way. When you can talk to me in a big girl voice or a big boy voice and, and talk to me calmly, um, then I will listen to you. But I can't understand you when you... Um, are behaving and talking in this way. So I'm just going to wait here with you until you decide to talk to me in a, in a, a more polite way. <clears throat> now, often when our children are behaving out of sorts or behaving in ways that we don't like, their relational needs are not being met. We kind of know about their physical needs, but children and all of us have relational needs. And again, this is another seminar that I do just focusing on this, which... Um, so I'm just giving you a shortened version here. And that's because God said in the Garden of Eden, it's not good for man to be alone. And if it wasn't good for man to be alone in the Garden of Eden, in a perfect world, face to face with God, it's not good for a child to feel alone in the world today. When children feel alone, particularly if they feel separated from us in some way or that we don't love them anymore or that we're angry with them and they feel alone from us, that is absolutely terrifying for them. 
and we need to be aware of what that feels like. I'll show a video later which will demonstrate some of that. So a relational need are all the things that in Paul, um, the New Testament, he says, do this for one another, accept one another as Christ has accepted you. So acceptance with your child is they have done something that completely messed up and they need to know that you will love them anyway, that their mess up has not come between them and your love. So we need to check and see whether our children need acceptance. So let them know that you accept them even when they've messed up. One day our son came home from playing football and he was the goalie and he'd let in a goal and the other team had won and his teammates were teasing him and his coach said something not kind and he came home and he was so distressed because no one had accepted him and we said look we accept you we love you anyway no matter what happened in the football game we are always here and we will always love you and that's the message they need to know no matter what happens in your life no matter what mess you get into we will be here for you also, they often need our affection. They need our love, our kindness, our cuddles, our loving words. They need to know as, as many times as we can tell them and in as many ways how much we love them. Quite often, they need our appreciation. And when they've done something well, we need to thank them for it. That is the most encouraging thing, the positive behavior. Not nagging that they haven't done something, but appreciating when they have done something. Think how appreciation makes you feel and how nagging makes you feel. And uh, then just think, if I spoke to my boss the way I speak to my child, or my boss spoke to me the way I speak to my child, how would I feel? What do I like? What encourages my positive behavior? And appreciation is very powerful. When they do something that you like and you say thank you, that is one of the most reinforcing things of positive behavior. Also, they need to know they are special to you. I'm so glad you're my child. I'm really glad God gave you to our family. Being your mom, your dad, your grandmother is one of the best things in my life. It's not about what they've done. You're saying you are special to me. And that is incredibly powerful. That's what God said to Jesus when he was baptized. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And every one of us and our children need to hear that message from God and from our parents. Many children need positive, loving attention from parents. And uh, Paul says, let each of you look out, not only for your own interest, but for the interest of others. And that often means slowing down, reading that, that book that they love for that like 100th time and you're bored out of your mind, but you do it because they love it. And children love to know they have a full, positive attention that is really lovely they need to see that when you see them your face lights up with joy that is the most amazing gift you can give to small children is that your face lights up with joy when you see them do they need your comfort some you know life is hard it's hard for us and it's tough for our kids they're little, they don't understand everything. Hard things happen and COVID is going on and so many things that were familiar have been taken away. They need our comfort. They need us not to say, stop crying. Um, big boys don't cry. We now know that we should let boys cry and comfort them because when we let boys cry and comfort them, they learn empathy. They learn how to comfort the tears of others, to accept the tears of others. When we tell them not to cry when they're sad or when they're hurt, we harden their hearts against empathy towards others. And we've just been discovering that through brain scans. Um, and we can see now children who experience um, violence or shouting going on around them in the first three years, um, either experiencing it between in the family home or towards themselves. Um, after, by the time they get to three and they scan their brains, the areas of the brain that should be empathic have gone. There are just black holes there. And we now know that these children are more likely to become violent in the future because the empathy area, the brain, when it kind of rewires when you're about three and it um, cuts out the things that haven't been used. And if empathy hasn't been used, it goes, hmm, that bit wasn't very useful. So we'll just rewire around that space. And then those children that are left finding it very difficult to empathize with others in the future. We want to create loving children who love others and love God. And we do that 
by pouring all the love and comfort we can into them in those first three years when their brains are developing in this special way. Often our children need some encouragement for us. Encouragement is towards the goals they have for themselves, something they want to do. And we come alongside them and just give them a boost, give them a hand, cheer on the sidelines and say, we want to encourage you. They also need our respect. So often we forget to show respect to our children and think we can talk down to them or shout at them in ways that are really disrespectful. If we want them to respect us, we need to show respect to them. We need to model it to them and between each other so they can really learn what respect means. Do they need some help from you? Um, we share one another's burdens. Often we ask children to do things they have no idea how to do. I remember one time telling my five-year-old son to go and tidy his room because like, well, that's what mums do, right? They tell their kids to go and tidy their room. And I went to see him in his room half an hour later and he was just playing on the floor and the room was a mess. And I looked around the room and I thought, well, I'm a grown-up and I wouldn't know where to start. And I'd never taught my five-year-old how to tidy his room. So I got down on the floor, I made it fun. I said, okay, let's get this box and let's see how quickly we can pick up all your cars and put them in this box. Let's have a race. You pick up the red ones, I'll pick up the blue ones and we did things like that. And, okay, now the clothes. Let's get all the clothes that need to go in the laundry and let's put them in the laundry. We need to teach our children how to do the tasks we expect them to do, to do them with them so they can learn well from us and feel supported. And because if we ask them to do something that they don't have any idea what to do, of course, they're not going to do it. They don't know how, um, and they're going to feel frustrated. Also, we need to help our children feel safe. Perfect love casts out fear. If we do something that makes them feel unsafe, if we create fear, that is not perfect love. And they learn to think that God also is not a safe person, is not supportive, doesn't care for them. So we need to make sure that our love casts out their fear. Now, when we want to tell our child, children to do something, when we make a request for their behavior, for their obedience, we need to go through a few things. And I think many of us um, have forgotten there is a process here. When we do these things well, then we can find our children are more likely to do what we ask. First of all, we need to have their attention, get them to look you in the eyes. Don't call to them from another room. Make sure you have their attention. If they're playing Lego in the living room and you're in the kitchen shouting a command, they are so engrossed in their Lego. They're not ignoring you, that they are so busy with their Lego and what they're trying to do that they have cut out any sound from you. And also, if we shout, the more we shout, the more our children will cut off the sound and not listen to us. So make sure they can see your face, touch them gently, get their attention, smile, make your face light up. And then tell them calmly and simply what you need them to do. And tell them one thing at a time, particularly when they're young. So, Simon, we're going to go and put your shoes on. Come with me and let's find your shoes. Okay, just shoes. Don't say, okay, now you need to put your shoes on, grab your bag, get your coat and get your lunch before we go out the house because you've given them four commands. And I know if I say that to my husband, he'll forget two of them. And he's a grown-up. So give them one thing at a time and give it calmly and simply. When they've done one thing, then give them the next thing. And then check they've understood what you've asked them to do by repeating it back. So tell me, what do you think you need to do? I have a funny story about this. We lived in a house one time where the kitchen was so small, the freezer was in the garage. So sometimes when I was making dinner, I would have to go out and get the frozen peas or whatever it was and bring it back into the house. I would spend hardly any time out there, maybe five minutes, because I knew exactly where everything was. So one day I was making lunch and I told my three-year-old Nathan to please watch your little brother Joel in the living room. Everything was safe there, I thought, while I go to the um, garage and bring in some food for lunch. Yes, mummy. Okay, so I went and I got the peas and I came back into the house and I went to look in the living room. In five minutes, baby Joel had pulled a yucca plant down, tipped up the whole big pot. He pulled the yucca plant out of the pot and dirt was 
were been dragged all across the pale carpet from one end of the living room to the other. And Joel was sitting there happily um, teething on the yucca plant, just like holding it and having a good chomp on the bark. <laughs> so I thought about this. And I, I didn't react. I just said to, so I took a deep breath. So Nathan, tell me what's happening here. And he said, I was watching Joel and it was really funny. It's like, oh, I get what the problem is. When I said, watch your little brother, he watches telly. He doesn't have to do anything. He just sit there and see what happens, right? So to him, watch meant just like see what he does. Just look at him, do whatever he does. It did not mean to him, stop him eating the yucca plant and, and tipping it up. And I hadn't told him not to let Joel touch the yucca plant. I told him to watch his little brother and he did exactly that. So he was very obedient. But I had to realize that I needed to get him to repeat back what um, he thought I had said, and I needed to be clearer about what I said to him so that I made a much clearer request. Then we need to encourage them with our tone of voice, our smile, show confidence that they will follow through, support, encourage, remind them patiently if they become distracted, and then thank them warmly when they have done the task. We need to go through a process a bit like this and make sure that they really understand what we're telling them to do, and we're not just shouting orders at them from another room. Remember that everything a child does, their behavior is a communication. So if a child is behaving in a way that seems to you not what you asked for, not what you expected, um, seems to be, quotes, naughty, think first, what is my child trying to tell me? They might be trying to tell you, I need something. Like, I'm really hungry. I'm tired. I need to go to bed. I'm overwhelmed by all these sensory emotions. I'm confused. I'm in a situation here and I have no idea what's happening. Like, as adults, we know what's happening, but we've never explained to the child what is going on in this strange context. It could be a family party. It could be something at church. It could be in the hospital. Talk to your child about what will happen, what's expected of them, what's going on, so they are not confused by suddenly being in a place they have no idea what's going on, what's happening. Sometimes their behavior is saying, change something. Like, this is intolerable. Do something about it. Maybe change my nappy. Um, but they're wanting us to change something, and so they get distressed. And it's the only way they can get our attention, and they hope we'll guess what they need us to do. And then sometimes they're saying, look, you're the grown-up. I'm the child. Sort this out. Um, so think about what communication is behind your child's behavior. What are they trying to tell you? And sometimes, as I will tell families, imagine their behavior has a great big speech bubble. And what would be in that speech bubble at this time? So, and think about what you really need. So sometimes older children, if they're doing something, or maybe even self-harming, I will say, if you, that's self-harming, Mark, if that had a big speech bubble, what, it be re, what would it really be trying to say to your family or to your friends or whoever? So try and help them think about what is it that I need to say and communicate rather than just behave in a, in a way to get attention or whatever it is. So we need to understand that challenging behavior is often a form of communication. They want us to listen to their needs. We also need to be aware about what to do when children tell a difficult truth. And uh, when children tell a difficult truth about their behavior and they want to come and tell you they've broken something, they disobeyed, something went wrong, we need to warmly thank them for having the courage to tell the truth and help them to deal with a problem they have created. Because, you know, if we punish them harshly when they tell the truth about something they have done wrong, they will learn to lie to prevent future punishment. We will then reinforce them to lie to us. So we need to be very aware how we respond to their behavior. When they show a character strength, courage, honesty, Whatever it is, we need to say that was courageous, that was honest, that was a good choice and help them to see they've made some good choices. And now let's just fix the problem together um, so that we don't reinforce behavior that we don't want to see later. Now, I'm just going to show you this video. This is if this works. This is called the still face video. And this gets you a taste of what it's like for a child to feel alone for just a few moments. Babies this young are extremely responsive to 
the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 34 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world, and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Powerful, isn't it, to watch that little child just experiencing aloneness from the mother for two minutes and to see the response, see how distressed she is, how she loses control of her, you know, she starts to scream, she loses control of her body, she becomes really distressed. And although we, we are older and we manage our body better, even at our age, when we feel an aloneness, when we feel someone that we love is turning away from us, we, we also have a sense of panic inside and we will try to get them back in different ways, attract their attention. Sometimes we even get argumentative because we want to say, do you really care about me? Do you notice me? Do you understand what I'm going through? Are you able to help me? And we know this happens all through our life, but it gets expressed in slightly different ways. And it's the anxiety that this relationship is um, is somehow broken and, and children don't know if you're going to mend it. And that's a challenge for them. So when they fear that that relationship has been broken and you might not ever come back, that is most terrifying. We now know that teenagers, if they have a row with their parents, and I guess this is for small children and you know all of us actually, if we have a row with someone that we love dearly, and we feel that relationship is broken. If it is mended by bedtime, it does not go on to cause them anxiety and even depression in teenagers. And in the Bible, it says, don't let the um, sun go down on your wrath. That is an important psychological principle. If we repair the relationship before we go to bed and we are happily loved and together again before that time, then our minds and hearts can survive that um, that tearing apart for a little while but not if it goes through the night then it starts to cause problems so we need to put ourselves in our children's situation do to others our children as we would have them do to us and it, and Emma might says be just what you wish your children to be when they shall have families of their own speak as you would have them speak to their own children and this says do something different whatever has gone before in your family you create that future generations of positive relationships, of modeling to them what they need to do to show love and care to their own families, how to speak lovingly and kindly with them so that you can be a transitional parent and teach them something about a new way to relate. We often need to remember that our children are still learning. Can they actually do what I expect them to do? 
So often as parents, we assume children can do certain things. Um, like, you know, I see people put a glass, a tall glass next to a two-year-old on the table and you know a two-year-old will knock it over. It's not they're being naughty. They cannot um, control their bodies well enough to manage a tall glass on the table. So you don't put the glass on the table. You make sure that the space around them is what they can manage um, because they can't yet manage it. And so we need to be able to differentiate between what is an accident, what is something the child is not developmentally able to do yet, and not punish them because they're still trying to learn. When children are afraid of punishment, they do not learn well. And they learn best when they feel happy, when there's laughter and joyfulness, and again, we'll learn about that next week. But I had a Jewish friend, and she said there's an interesting Jewish concept that they believe under 12s are still learning. You know, they became adults when they were 12. Under 12, they are still in a learning curve. And the responsibility is on the parents to be better teachers, not on the children to behave perfectly. They are still learning. And I thought, what a beautiful way to think about our children. They are still learning. How do we help them to learn well? It's my responsibility as a teacher to help um, create the best environment for them to learn well. <clears throat> Keep it simple. If I was to do one thing again, if I lived my life over and had children again, then I would keep my life and my home much more simple. Because today, many children are easily overwhelmed. They have too many toys. They're all over the floor. And I see what happens. They don't play with anything very well. They don't learn from what they're playing. They do a little bit here and a little bit there. And they don't develop a good attention span. It's better for them to have limited choices, less toys, easy storage. And I would put away all the toys, if I was to do it again, except 10. Every week they could choose 10 toys to bring downstairs and to have and to play with. And then they would go back up and into the attic or whatever, and then they would choose 10 more. Because when there are less toys, it's easy to store, easy to manage, easy to put away. And we don't create a situation where the children have so much going on around them that they cannot um, manage their, the materials, the toys, very well. So I'd have less toys and keep things simple, maybe less clothes out for them to make a mess of. Just keep things really simple so they can manage their own their, their life and their rooms better and pace your schedule and need by example. Quite often our lives are just way too busy and we need to simplify our own lives so that we can walk slowly um, with our children and not be rushing around. Now, Judy talked about physical punishment, and we now know that children who experience physical punishment, um, it affects their brains, and it, um, particularly if they have it in the very early years, but also later, it can, um, it can make them lo lose empathy with others and to make it harder for them to love others. And it creates fear. Perfect love casts out fear. So if we're doing anything that causes a child to fear, to fear pain or punishment, then we need to really think about that because that is not perfect love. And when we punish children physically, we teach the child that it's okay to hit people who don't do what they want them to do. That's what they learn. So if someone else doesn't do what they want them to do, then they can hit them because that's what's happened to them. It can set a pattern for future violence. Um, it builds anger, resentment, and rebellion in a child's heart. When I talk to children, or well, adults, who've been um, brought up in homes where they had a lot of physical punishment, the anger, resentment, and rebellion in their heart is, is very high, and it's quite difficult for them to manage as adults. And when we just uh, respond to children's behavior with physical punishment, it does not teach a child positive behavior or self-control. What they learn from us is that they can be violent. What they learn from us is they don't have to be self-controlled. They can hit someone whenever they like if, um, if they're not happy. And ultimately, the worst thing is I think it can distort a child's picture of God as a punitive parent coming after them with a big stick or whatever, rather than the loving and forgiving father. Because it shapes the way children see God. The way we parent should reflect um, God's love and, and God's character. So our children want to fall in love with God and not run away from him. So it's very important for us to think carefully. Now, we've all grown up with, um, with like heritages of different kinds of discipline and punishment from the past. And that's 
people did the best they could at the time, but now we know something different. Now we're more aware of the effect it has on children and the way their brains develop, the way they relate to other people in the future. And there's been a lot of research gathered about this, that no child is born violent, uh, but it gets created in their brain in the first three years of life by the experiences and what they witness and what they experience on their own body in the very early stages of their life. It shapes their brain. So, spare the rod. It's very interesting because that rod is a shepherd's rod. And shepherds do not use their rods to hit sheep. You would never find a shepherd hitting sheep with a rod. Why? Because if you're a shepherd and you hit your sheep with a rod, they will run away, they will be scared of you, and you will have the most difficult time to bring them back together into a herd and lead them. They will not want to follow you. They'll be all over the place. They will run away because sheep are like that. And so shepherds did not use their rods to hit the sheep. And it's very important that the sheep are not afraid of the shepherd. So the shepherd's rod is in Psalm 23. It guides us through the valley of the shadow of death. It guides us, it comforts us, it keeps us safe, it sets safe boundaries. It was used to protect sheep from falling over the edge of cliffs, to hook them out of pits, to, to guide them safely and to fend off um, enemies and, and dangers. So the shepherd's rod is a rod of caring, of guidelines, safe boundaries. And that's what we need to create as parents. That's what is important. That's what helps our children not to be spoiled, is when they have clear boundaries, they're comforted, they're kept safe. We, we do things to prevent them from falling over the edge and help them do their best to behave well and stay on the path we want them to stay. And if they do fall over the edge and get in a pit, it gently hooks them out and rescues them and sets them straight or maybe even carries them until they can walk again. So we need to really understand what this rod is and how it can be used in positive ways um, when we think about positive discipline. And the one thing we need to be aware of when we're creating discipline for children is they need to have clear boundaries. They need to have um, as few rules as possible to make it easy for them to remember them, but they also need to have a clear boundary. And we need to check they understand that boundary because we can say something like, what's your brother? Or all sorts of things and they have no idea. So we would take our son Joel to watch football. The older brother Nathan would be playing football and Joel would go along and he would play in the park on the side while Nathan played football. So if we said to Joel, don't go and play in the football game, don't go and run into there because um, that's, you know, don't do that. He doesn't necessarily know what that means. Don't go and play in the football game. Don't go over this boundary. So we need to show what it's like. We need to show them the white line and say, this is the boundary. You mustn't go over this. And actually, you're safest if you stay way out of that boundary, you know, at least a few feet away from it, because sometimes the ball and people will fall over the edge or run over the edge of the game and you could get bumped into so we show him the clear boundary, show what it looks like, explain why it's important. It's important to stay on this side of this white line so that people don't bump into you, you don't get mixed up in the game, you don't make people angry. You stay safe, you help the game to go well, and you are a safe person on this side, well away from what they're doing running around. And then you check the child understands it. So which boundary do you have to stay away from? And what does that mean to you? What do you have to do? So you check that they recognize, don't go over the white lines. In fact, stay well away from the white lines. And then make it easy to stay well away from the white lines. So, <clears throat> so okay, Joel, so we're going to play over here. Well away, we're going to have this ball, but we're going to make sure it doesn't go anywhere near that line or anywhere, um, anywhere near the game. And so we play with him, make it easy to stay away from that boundary that has been set. Then enforce it warmly, gently and consistently. So, Joel is, is cheeky. Joel's mischievous, and he will move closer and closer to the white line. He wants to check. He wants to check whether I really need. Uh, if somebody has the mute, could you mute your microphone, please? Because the your conversation's coming back. 
and interrupting the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. So let me enforce the boundary. He will go near and near to it. He'll look at me with a cheeky smile going like, okay, I need to know, Mummy, whether you really mean this. So I say, yes, Joel, that's the boundary. Let's stay this side. Come, come away, let's play over here. So I enforce it warmly and gently so he knows I mean it. And then when he's playing in the right place, I say, this is great, Joel. This is the right place to play. Let's play here where we're nice and safe and let's have fun together. <clears throat> when discipline is vital is when the, there has been an intentional boundary rebelliously crossed. So the child knew it was a boundary, they defiantly crossed the boundary. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't that they didn't understand. It wasn't that they they just couldn't manage their emotions anymore. They intentionally do something you have told them not to do. And that is when we need to have some discipline. And how do we do that? Well, the first thing we need to do is connect. You know, when people messed up in the Bible, God God connects with them. And Jesus connects with them. You know, he he. He makes connection with Zacchaeus, with the woman at the world, woman caught in adultery. He lets them first know he cares, and he accepts them no matter what. And then he works on changing their life. Rules for that relationship equal rebellion. So if we don't have that warm relationship and we try to enforce rules, the child will rebel. Then we need to respond to their emotions before responding to their behaviors. If they're angry, help them to calm down listen to them. If they're sad or hurt because they did something you told them not to and now they've, now they've broken their ankle or they've hurt themselves, deal with that. Comfort them, calm them, get them healing, get them care. Respond to the emotions and the distress before dealing with the behavior. If you don't calm the emotion down first, it's very difficult for them to, to deal, for you and them to deal with what's happened. Make sure they do not fear being rejected by you or being disconnected from you. Yes, you rebelled. Yes, you did something you were not supposed to do. But you need to know, I still care for you. I still love you. We will work through this um, together. And if we make a mistake or have hurt the child, we need to apologize to them. Because when we have made a mistake, we will teach them how to make a good apology and ask for forgiveness. We need to be that model in their lives. So make sure they understand which boundary was broken and why it's important to make sure it doesn't happen again. Quickly show warmth, love, and acceptance. Don't contribute to their aloneness. Time in, I should say, is much better for children than time out. We used to think children needed time out to calm down, but they need time in. That's time connected with a caring adult that is far more helpful to help them calm down. So rather than give children time out and say, go away, be on your own, go to your room, um, then, then be with them. Sit with them while they calm down. Don't leave them on their own. Um, I, I know somebody in my family, um, one of my relatives, was once told by their mother, go to your room and you're not having any tea. And they, they were so distressed. They were nine and they were so distressed by being sent away um, that they wanted their mother to learn a lesson because there were lots of other children in the family. And they, they felt like they wanted to commit suicide. Now, that sounds really strong and really powerful. This was a nine-year-old. Um, who just felt so overwhelmed by being sent on their own to their room. They just couldn't handle it when they were distressed. So make sure that you don't pull away from your children. Pray for wisdom to respond. Find a good time to talk privately with your child about what went wrong. Don't shame them in front of the rest of the children. Don't yell at them and put them down. Speak calmly and respectfully. And don't say, why did you do that? Because that's a question they can't answer. And they will try to make up excuses because they don't know why. Or they'll even lie to us because they can't really tell you why. They've often been overwhelmed by all sorts of things that don't make sense to them. So it's best to ask things like, what happened? Tell me what happened step by step. What, went, what happened there? So that I can understand how that happened and we can make sure it doesn't happen again. So the best thing is natural and logical consequences linked to the wrong behavior. They took a cookie before dinner. They don't get one afterwards when anyone else does. So it's, this is the best kind of discipline. This is the discipline God gives to us. If you do this, then this is what's going to happen. Um, if you don't pay your bills, you, will get, you won't be able to stay in your flat. If you drive your car too fast, your license will be taken away from you. Natural and logical consequences is good lessons for life. And so that's what you do. Whenever possible, link the consequence to the behavior so it makes sense to them. It's not just a punishment for the sake of it. 
Um, and if, if you take something away from them, just take it away for a short time, particularly um, phones and devices. I know they can be contentious, but only take things away for a short time if you need to do that. Um, or try and have boundaries for the whole family together about how devices are used and when. Um, ask older children what should be a logical discipline from them. We did this with our children. We got them to set the rules when they were teenagers, and they set the, the, the consequences for misbehavior. And so when they did something, we would say, okay, so what do you think should be the punishment? And they would say things like, oh, well, I think you should ground us for like two weeks. And we'd say, oh, no, that's, that's way too long. Um, we'll just make it for one week. And they would think that we're being extra gracious to them. And that would often be more effective. Children need to experience grace to us as well. Um, unexpected grace when they've done something wrong is very powerful to children and helps them to understand God's grace. Then they need to help put things right because that restores their sense of self-worth. And if they've hurt someone, they need to, like their brother or sister or upset their brother or sister, get them to do something kind for them. That's the best kind of consequence. If you hurt them, now you must do something kind. And find them doing something well. Give special attention when they're doing something right. That's really important. Notice their character strengths, which is a whole other seminar that I do. <clears throat> but we need to know what their character strengths are and say, you are being brave then, you are being helpful then, you are being kind then, and tell them that. And those words will shape their positive character. So we talked about having simple rules. Kay Kuzma says, don't hurt yourself, don't hurt other people, don't damage things. I can tell you as a, as a child psychologist, make your rules positive where you can. Say, rather than saying don't, say do this. This is what I want you to do. Um, if you say don't do this, then there's an awful lot of options. And they can often kind of do something else that's not quite right. But if you say, this is what I want you to do, and be very clear about it, they know exactly what they should do. So the clearer we state it, the better. Also, young children don't tend to hear don't. They hear hurt yourself, hurt other people, damage things. They, they, they can't really deal with a negative. So they will hear us say something like, don't do this, and they will think we've said, do it. <clears throat> we need to be aware of that, <clears throat> that dynamic. They listen to the verb um, and not the other things. So here are some useful websites. There's um, Action Against Violence with lots of research on there about violence against women and children and the research that shows um, how violence gets created in children's brains. There's a very good website called handsonscotland.co.uk, which I actually did some of the writing for when I was in Scotland. And it's a brilliant website full of ideas to help children flourish and positive ways of dealing with their troubling behaviours. So you have um, an angry child or someone that's wetting the bed or someone that is biting other children. What to do about it? <clears throat> you can go there. But it also has lots of ideas for helping children and uh, develop their character, um, deal with their emotions, um, have optimism and positive things and stay healthy. So it's a good way to help children flourish and also to give you information about dealing with their troubling behaviours. There's also Young Minds for Children's Mental Health. And letitripple.org is a brilliant website on developing character by the Jewish community, but it is for everyone. And it tells you what the character strengths are that you can nurture in your children, creative ways to do that. There's learning, um, and learning activities, videos, research about all the different character strengths. And also my own website, um, there is some material there on family spirituality, and we have some colourful placemats to help you talk at dinner table about faith matters, all sorts of things that are on there. So you can see those too. If you want to know more about parenting positively, then this is a book that I wrote, which is available from the Life Source Bookshop, 52 Ways to Parent Happy Children. And um, so if you're short of ideas, there's some there. And what I love at the back, there's a whole section at the back of something like 75 ways to increase your child's happiness and lots of fun things you can do to help them feel happy and loved. And now I'm wondering what new ideas you've had today that will help you nurture your child's positive behavior, and what will you do to put those ideas into action? I am continually learning, reading, discovering, learning from my grandchildren and, and how my daughter parents, and because she reads a lot more of these things than I do now, so I'm learning all the time about how to help families nurture their children's positive behavior. And I'm happy to learn from you too. And I'm also happy to answer your questions. So 
I will um, open up now for some questions. Generally, what I would do is people would submit questions and I would share them out between us in groups and see what we could do ourselves because you all have amazing ideas about how to parent children and lots of experiences and we can learn from each other. Um, but that's not possible here, so we'll do it in this different way. So, I'm looking to see whether I'm looking to see whether there's any questions in the chat, and I think you've all been so busy listening. <laughs> Sister Judy, we can't hear you. You're muted. You're mute. Oh, thank you. I'm so sorry. I was just saying thank you so much to Karen. Uh, there has been so much uh, information from that presentation. Um, I was just saying nobody's actually put any questions in the chat. I'm assuming you were listening attentively and there was a lot uh, of information from the slides. So now it's question time. Please either raise your hand or just give an indication that uh, who, who's going to ask the first question. Well, I can see someone's written, how do we deal with teenagers at a, at a rebellious stage? And actually, I'm doing a presentation on that for the Ringway Church on Monday night. Um, I'm not sure of the link for that. Um, but if you, if you Google Ringway Church in Manchester, then you should be able to find, um, find something about that. Um, I'm not sure how to get that information to you. But also, if any of you, if you email me, I can send you the handout. Um, and I might even be able to send you a link to another time I did a talk about teenagers um, mm -hmm. because that's quite special. Some of these things still work to help you with that. Um, but if you want to find out more about teenagers, if you can come to Ringway Church on Monday night, you'll find out more. Someone says, I didn't mention another great book called Please God Make My Mummy Nice. So that was yeah. it's now called um, Muddy Fingers, Sticky Feet. And it's available from, um, from the Life Source bookshop. And it was everything I learned about God from being a mum. So it was kind of crazy, sad, funny, hilarious, messy stories about being a mum um, and what each one of them taught me about God's love. So, But it's, it's now called Another Name. Um, yes. That would, yeah. And say, so please put your emails or if you email me with a request, I'll make sure it's all coordinated and the information gets to you. Uh, I'll put mine in here. It's Kay Holford at adventist.org. And I'm happy to send you, um, send you some handouts if you just tell me what your greatest need is. At the moment, I can tell you for the next month, I'm not going to have time to do detailed questions, um, but I can happily send you handouts. Um, Yes, please put your emails in. Right, does anyone have any questions for Karen, please? Someone has sent me a direct message, and I could could I say that you direct mess you you email me about that? Um, okay, that that would be the most helpful thing to do because that might be too much to deal with in this context here. Okay, I, I have a question. Please, uh, please. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you. I was trying to type it, but I don't type very quickly, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> How do you deal with um, children who are, have ASD? My son, um, if, when I try to discipline him, because he's very rule-driven, the mm -hmm. thought of breaking a rule devastates him. Mm -hmm. So a simple conversation about what's gone wrong becomes mm -hmm. something that goes on for weeks in his mind, yeah. even though it's done and dusted for me. Mm -hmm. um, and he hurts quite deeply afterwards. Yes. I think it's important to be, every child is different and every child responds to those different things differently. Um, I find it helpful to actually focus on positive um, and that really my seminar on character strengths would be quite helpful. So I look at the character strengths and encourage them, tell them every time they're doing things towards that that's helpful. Um, children do need to know boundaries and it's how do you then present it in a way that they can you know, cause less distress to them in, in their, the way that they understand things because it can be very overwhelming for them. I have a grandson with similar issues and I can see what's what's happening to him there. Um, I think I think the best thing to do is email me separately for children with quite unique needs because that's a different thing. I'm not so expert in that area. 
Um, but what I have learned is that the more a child's relational needs are met, uh, we found this with our children, the more we've met their relational needs, and I can send you a handout about that, we honestly hardly ever have to deal with their behavior. My youngest son told me, Mum, I can never remember you telling me off. And I like, I know I did a bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> but because their relational needs were met, but they honestly hardly ever behaved out of sorts and very difficult. Um, and I think that's, that's a huge thing. And some children are easier than others. But when their relational needs are met and they, they understand what that is and they feel that, um, it really makes a huge difference to them. And it doesn't... Um, it doesn't actually take that much time to meet a lot of the emotional needs. It's maybe 10 sentences a day. You can drop into conversations that will really be helpful. Um, so I can send you that. And it's really a positive way of helping to children to deal with their behavior. Thank you. Um, I see Felicia has a hand up. Uh, yes. Thank you for the wonderful... Um, I really enjoyed myself, to be honest with you. And I felt like... Um, oh, dear. I've done everything wrong. <laughs> oh, that's what I felt. Anyway, um, but, you know, I'm willing to learn. What was the book that you showed us, Ayla? I sort of miss that title, that book. Well, this one is 52 Ways to Parent Happy Children. Okay, thank you. That was what I was, I was uh, asking about. What I would say oh. is, like, you know, we've all done things as parents. You know, we, we, we did the best we could with the experience we had and the knowledge we had and, you know, no one is ever a perfect parent and, you know, a third of God's children didn't disobey and, you know, created a big mess. Um, and I think we need to be kind to ourselves as well. We need compassion to ourselves to help us be um, a parent. And when I don't know what to do and I feel all out of sorts, I imagine I go and sit in God's lap and he gives me a big hug. And I just listen to the kindest things he will say to me. He wants to encourage the heart of every parent and he wants every child to be encouraged. And that, that's what he wants, that we all experience his love. So I go and sit in his lap, experience his love, take a deep breath, and then I look at my child or whoever through his eyes, see what he sees in that child or the other person, the hurt, the struggle. And then that transforms how I see them and how I respond. And that's my go-to whenever I'm really not sure what else to do. Um, someone's asked about showing kindness and warmth to a child after they've done something wrong. Yeah. Actually, I would show kindness and warmth quickly and then redirect. It's the whole build. Make sure they don't feel disconnected from you. And it's really hard because, you know, they can make you, like, really angry and really frustrated. And it's really hard to kind of stay calm when they, when they need you to be calm. But I would quickly as, kind of swallow that down and quickly show a way to be kind and warm and cuddle them and... and while you're talking to them and talk to them calmly about what went wrong. Um, because I think that's that's quite important. It's quite a shift in our thinking about doing that. It's so easy just to come out with telling them off and having a good yell. And, you know, I, I've been there. Um, um, done some crazy things as parents do. So, um, but I would now I would show the kindness and warmth first and then get them to talk through what do you think happened there? What, what happened? What was going on in your head? Because sometimes, as I say, they don't realize they've done something wrong. They don't realize that that they've, um, that, you know, until they've done something, you know, until the thing is broken or something else has gone wrong, that they were doing something you didn't want them to do. So ask them to tell you what happened first and ask them to talk to you and ask them and then help them to put the thing right in some way to help restore their self-confidence. Mm -hmm. um, Other questions? Someone, Amisha, is this a question? If I have a, if I have spank, oh, remind, no, somebody wanted to ask something about physical chastisement. Anisha? No. Any other questions? Speak up. Yes, this has been recorded and it's, on the Children's Ministry Facebook page, is it? Judy? Yes. People are asking about seeing it again. They missed it. Yes, and Instagram. Mm. I'll also tell you a story. So one Sabbath school teacher came to me and said, I don't know what to do about this child. 
he's as a 10 year old boy and he's i can't deal with him in the class he's hurting other children he's miserable he's uncooperative i am tearing my hair out and so i said what's going on in his life this is what we always need to ask what's going on in their life what's going on at school what's going on in the family and then the teacher told me well about a year ago his father left the home they don't know where he is he hasn't been back in touch he's the oldest child the only boy in the home with two small um, sisters and and i said this this child is just so sad he is so sad he's missing his dad he might not even be able to talk about it at home because he doesn't know what effect that will have on mum he feels like suddenly he has to be the man in the house and do all sorts of things he doesn't have a role model he's hurting he is a distressed child um so why don't you deal with his distress and then see what happens about 2 months later the sub school teacher came back to me and she'd taken time to talk to this boy to be a friend with him to give him some responsibility in the class to listen to him to invite him to talk about what it was like at home and she said I've never had to deal with his behavior problems again so it's always good to find out what's going on in their life what is the distress that they can't talk about and next week's session will be about helping children with their big emotions and us too When I did the seminar I'm doing next week and I, I had to I was given a book and told make make a day long seminar on this for the hands on Scotland. Um I learned so much about managing my own emotions and my own emotional balance and it has transformed my life and that is the basis from which I will share with you next week. And the information is good for adults and for children and uh, so I hope that you will come and um that will help you too. Thank you so much. Okay, so the recording is live on our Facebook page SEC Children's Ministries. So be sure to follow us there and also just to remind everyone uh with the Easter program coming up uh journey uh to the cross on the sabbath the 3rd of uh april uh please remember to send continue to send in your recordings um of children singing doing poetry etc uh from an extract of the story of of jesus so uh, that's just just a reminder there so karen thank you so much indeed and you can tell from you know the volume of questions and uh there will be some uptake of issues to be raised offline by individuals so that's and i just um, sorry yeah. can i just down to the last couple of questions that have come in um yeah. okay so someone has been really honest and said okay if i do spank and i justify it with the bible with the kids how do i put it right and i would say that, you know this this has happened in lots of homes until we knew like a different way And I would say if this is if you want to change the way you parent your kids the best thing to do is to just calmly apologize and said when I did this I was doing what I thought was the best and I'm sorry that that wasn't the best it was the best that I know how I have always loved you and I always will and now I want to try a different way and that'd be difficult to make the change but I really want to do it and um and I and, and I just like to ask your forgiveness for what has gone on so we can make a new start here. So that's sometimes what's helpful if you decide to make a transition in the way that you've parented um and um and find a different way to um respond to children's behavior. I think most of it is understanding why they're doing this and dealing with that issue. That's mostly what's going on in in, in children. And someone says if a sibling does something unkind to their sibling then the best thing to do is to get them to do something kind that's the logical response so and and i'm seeing more and more people doing that and finding that's quite helpful so if they do something unkind you don't force them to say i'm sorry and when they don't feel sorry because you know we've all done that <laughs> i'm sorry and they're not really sorry um they're just doing it to get off the hook but if they have to go and do something kind you're reinforcing the positive opposite behavior that you want to see So if you do something unkind, you need to find out what would be kind. Listen to how that hurt your sibling. Listen to the effect it had on them. Listen to something they would really like you to do for them that they know you can do and then do it kindly for them. It might be make their favorite drink or play their favorite game with them in a positive way, but you do something kind. And if you don't do it kindly, you have to do another kind thing. And I think this is what then becomes a positive logical consequence. that they can help to um repair the relationship. That's great. 
Thank you so much. It's it's always difficult uh, with children, but I just think you've given us so much insight uh, and guidance. And um, I'm sure, by God's grace, one of those will work. And remember, pray always, pray without ceasing. Yes, <laughs> we all need that. <laughs> Then next week at the same time, we have, um, I don't know if there are any places left, but uh, we have uh, helping uh, to balance your children's emotions. And I think, again, with the pandemic and the challenges that we've all faced as adults and children continue to face going back to school, many have fallen behind. It was absolutely critical to have a seminar to support parents on how to navigate our way through that. Um, I'm a governor of uh, three schools and one of the schools um <laughs> i suppose it doesn't really matter how much people pay each year but it's almost twenty thousand a year five attempted suicides and we've had to double the uh, pastoral care and counseling service um to to help support uh, families and what what has been discovered there is that a lot of children have bottled things up whilst they've been some have described themselves as being incarcerated at home with their parents and they've just been glad to get back to school and they just share everything is coming out so i'm sure that um the next week will be informative and i'm told it's also going to be uh, in somewhat interactive so please do uh, sign up and uh, send me an email if you're not able to um, to book in because I know that uh, we've had 170 sign up for that one so um, yeah and then on Sunday next week is the KCFS so if you haven't signed well that's I think that's fully fully subscribed already so we'll have to wait for the next one but yes Karen I think it's fitting to ask you to close us out in prayer please and thank you so much Oh, you're really welcome. And before I before I close the prize, I saw some more questions about kindness. Mm -hmm. And on the TED Family Ministries website, we have a whole section called Live Kind on nurturing kindness in families and in communities and churches. So if you're looking for kindness ideas, there's lots of lists of kindness ideas. So look for Live Kind on the TED Family Ministries website. Let's pray. Thank you, Karen. Father God. We pause and we just want to thank you for your incredible love for us. We often don't spend enough time just thinking about your love for us. Sometimes our own experience of being parented has left us with fear that you might not love us if we do this or that or that we've upset you and hurt you. And we know that you love us completely no matter what we do. Just as loving parents love their children no matter what mess they're in. In fact, we often stoop down to pick them up and help them even more. And that's what you do for us, God. You don't ever let us go. You keep on loving us no matter what. Nothing we can do can make you love us more or less. And so we live in that safe place of love and help that to soak into our minds and hearts what that truly means for us. So that we can pass that incredible love on through the way that we parent to our children, knowing that we are co-parenting your children you will help us and the most important thing we can do is to develop characters that are like yours and love them and and make sure that they stay in contact with you throughout their entire lives they choose to follow you they love you and they love those around them this is a difficult task as well but we don't do it alone and we know that we can turn to you whenever we don't know what to do we can just climb into your lap Feel your hug around us, your love for us. Listen to your heart for us and for your child and give us the wisdom and love to know what to do next. Thank you so much. You're so precious to us. May each person here know that they are your precious son and daughter and so are their children. It's amazing. Thank you. Through Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much once again, Karen, and we look forward to next week's presentation. Thank you to everyone um, who've at who's attended uh, and have a blessed week and hopefully we'll see you next week uh, and at future seminars. Blessings to you all. Thank you again for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me, Judy. Thank you, Karen. Take care.